kinda only makes sense as an LMG if you're playing a GBB or real cap only game. This will be a hard no from me. This has the worst ammo capacity on the market for a saw, rendering it useless as a saw, and unrealistic as well. VFC as usual didn't think this through like usual. Like usual it's pretty usual like usual. I feel like mag capacity makes this a non-starter. A huge missed opportunity for realism. The 100 round mags kind of defeat the purpose of it being a support gun. All these awesome game changing features all seem like downsides, not selling points. Heavy machine gun! Oh, he's hit, he's hit. That thing is <laughs> That's scary. Got him. Oh, I see it, Gilly. He's hit. Got him. Weirdest saw reload ever. Ah! Hit! Oh, right side, right side! Got him. That thing is shaking the entire building. Good. Oh. Oh, yeah. Got him. Got him. Welcome to Explosive Enterprises, and today we bring you the confluence of three things we love. Weird airsoft guns, machine guns, and gas blowback. The VFC M249 lands right in the middle, and surprisingly soon after its announcement in just December of last year. Well, it turns out that may have had some consequences, but as usual, let's start with the history of the M249. In the early 1970s, the US Army began trials for a new weapon concept, a man-portable weapon capable of sustained fire and chambered in a novel 6mm cartridge. Multiple prototypes were trialed, with a specification for 6mm soon dropped in favor of the standard 5.56 due to logistical concerns, and by 1980 FN's Mini-Me light machine gun was the winner, designated XM249E1. In 1984, it was formally adopted as the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon. 
While the Minimi, or M249, meets all technical definitions of a light machine gun, doctrinally the label of squad automatic weapon denotes a slightly different role. Unlike many earlier magazine-fed automatic rifles and light machine guns, the M249 is an open-bolt belt-fed automatic weapon with interchangeable barrels, but unlike traditional belt-fed medium machine guns, it's chambered in an intermediate caliber and designed to be managed by a single operator without an assistant gunner. As a result, the M249 can be allocated at a fire team level as a direct replacement for the M16A1 previously issued for automatic riflemen, but offering a much higher sustained rate of fire and greater effective range. Since its introduction, the M249 has served in every major military conflict in which the United States has participated, undergoing multiple rounds of gradual modernization. And while the Marines have replaced the M249 with the M27 IAR, and the Army now also has a 249 on the chopping block, it still remains in frontline service with Special Forces units. Outside the US, the Minimi has been adopted by over 50 countries, making it one of the most prolific light machine guns ever made, and becoming cemented in pop culture as the default generic light machine gun. VFC's rendition is a bit weird. Normally, we'd now identify the exact variant it's replicating and the history of it, but there are some subtle details to note, so instead we'll go over externals first. So, let's get right into it. First off, it is significant that this gun is almost entirely aluminum and not zinc aluminum alloy, aka pot metal. As with prior VFCs, most of the aluminum parts have a coarse gray finish very close to the phosphate parkerizing they're trying to replicate, and they've even added fake weld beads to further sell it. However, the finish does appear to scratch and wear easily on contact points, although rubbing some oil into all the externals seems to have helped. The few steel parts blend in quite well, so I'll specifically point them out along the way, but just so I don't have to say the word aluminum a thousand times, assume a part is aluminum unless stated otherwise. Up front, the muzzle device replicates the para flash hider used in conjunction with the 13.7 inch short barrel for the M249. This is actually a slip-over device, and if I unscrew it clockwise, it reveals standard 14mm negative threading on a short section of barrel. I can actually unscrew the barrel stub too, which will be relevant for accessorizing later. The front sight is a rigid block that is adjustable only for elevation, using a M249 specific tool, or you can make one pretty easily from a large bolt. The cross pin is steel, and this is used to retain the heat shield on US issue M249s. On the underside of the front sight is the gas tube, and specifically this is a modern fixed variant. Older M249s had a two-position adjustable gas regulator with an adverse condition setting, but this was eliminated in the early 2000s, so right off the bat that identifies this gun as a relatively modern M249. Behind it, we can just see the bare aluminum of the gas tube, and then the collar that secures it to the receiver. The bipod is a classic Minimi style, which clamps into the handguard for retention. This design was replaced in the mid-2010s with a new one, which has its own locking mechanism and is spaced out so it can go around a foregrip on a quad rail. Well, the original design here is legs that extend via just pulling and then collapse back in by pushing on the locking tabs, but the surface finish adds a ton of friction, at least until lubricated. We highly recommend greasing or oiling the exterior of the entire gun, but particularly the bipod if you intend to use it. Behind the bipod is a pair of pintle mounts, with the front one being steel. Above it, we can just see the front of the receiver and the sling loops, which are on the sides. Note that the loops themselves are steel inserts in the aluminum receiver. The handguard is standard plastic M249 handguard, replaced by a tri-rail in the late 2000s. It's a smooth, shiny plastic pretty similar to its real counterpart, and while it does have some play out of the box, it does not exhibit any flex or creaking. A few layers of electrical tape where it contacts the receiver is enough to take up the slack. Above that, we find the barrel change handle, which is the design used from the late 80s onwards. This has two stowage positions, which can be reached by pushing the handle back and then rotating, and from either position it can be simply pulled out to lock into the upright position. This is steel, as is the collar around the barrel that it attaches to, as is the barrel latching mechanism, which releases if the barrel is fully depressed while the bolt is back. I want to point out that while the hop is adjusted by a grub screw on top of the barrel, there is a tiny, tiny slot cut in the hinge assembly that allows adjustment without removing the barrel. The top cover is a railed variant introduced in the early 2000s, which moves the rear sight assembly back to make room. The rear sight is a complex arrangement with one knob for windage adjustment and another for range compensation, with numerical distances given in meters. Of these parts, only the pins and a tab at the rear are steel. You might wonder how a rail top cover can hold zero, and yeah, this does have a bit of play, but the spring-loaded catches on either side return it to a consistent position. If I squeeze both catches, I can pop open the feed tray cover, and as I lift it up, it snaps under the barrel retaining lever, holding it open although not strictly locked in place. Now you might notice that the catches have a bit of play, and you might be touched by the good idea fairy and think, hey, 
I can pop that spring out and bend it a bit for more tension. Don't do it. Just... just don't. Anyways, now we see the inner workings of the gun. The feed tray is locked in place by a single tiny screw. This does not appear to be strictly necessary, as nothing seems able to come loose or fall out if the feed tray is allowed to pivot like the real thing, and it even has markings on the underside. At some point in development, VFC decided to clamp the feed tray down, but why is still a little unclear. Well, otherwise, we have the drive fire toggle visible here, which interacts with the stop on empty mechanism that we'll explain later. As well, we have the wiggler, a steel lever loosely patterned after the ejector on a real M249. This is actuated by the bolt carrier to make a dummy belt shake a little. There's also a hard rubber piece screwed into the right side of the receiver, which just provides a tactile bump for the charging handle to ride over, simulating the feeling of camming the locking lugs on the real thing. And of course, there's the bolt carrier assembly, but I'll go over that during disassembly. Oh, and I didn't talk about the inside of the feed tray cover, which rather than containing a complex feed pawl assembly, instead just has a simple groove and notch for the magazine. Closing that up, on the right side you can see how the charging handle interacts with the spring-loaded dust cover on the feed tray cover, camming it out of the way as it passes. The charging handle also pops open the ejection port, although note that if this is closed again, it will not pop open when the gun is fired as it would on an AR. Both of these covers are steel. On the right side of the gun, we have the primary markings, and I have to apologize as we can't tell you very much about the gun's markings. We know that the serial number here is the third line, C05204, and the designation 3S679 below it is the cage code for FN America, and the longer repeated tag on other parts is a manufacturer's code. So we can confirm that this is patterned off an American-made M249 of some variety, but beyond that we have no insight as we cannot find serial number ranges or marking legends in the public domain. Anyways, on the left side we find the magwell, which on the real gun allows it to use standard AR magazines in an emergency. This is notoriously unreliable, and even when it does work it will chew up feed lips in a hurry, but for the airsoft version this has been repurposed as a gas inlet. Note though that on a real M249 this cover snaps shut when the magwell is not in use, but here it stays open with the release tab sticking up because the inlet is in the way. Underneath the gun is the box mag hanger, and this is steel, but the weld securing it to the magwell is fake, and it's actually only held on by two small screws. Now pretty much all the screws on the gun come threadlocked, but on all four guns in our local group, these specific screws were not, and on all four they started to loosen just from shooting. It is extremely important to secure the hanger with either threadlocker or epoxy, and we'll show how to do that during disassembly. Now we have the trigger group with a simple two position steel safety and steel cross pins. The grip itself is a different plastic from the handguard with a more matte feel and appearance, and it includes a trapdoor for storing an oil bottle. Moving to the back, the lower takedown pin is steel and secures both the trigger group and the stock, while the upper pin, which is also steel, just secures the stock and has a knurled knob to make it easier to pull. This isn't a screw, it just pulls straight out, but out of the box it was very tight and needed to be worked loose. Lastly, the stock, which is made of the same plastic as the grip. At first glance, this looks like the second generation M249 stock, introduced in the late 80s and replaced with a collapsible stock in the early 2010s. However, if we compare it to a real one, it lacks the shoulder rest, Say the line, Bart. known to some as a barrel shroud, yeah! and the sling loop is on the front of the stock rather than the back. This is actually not an M249 stock at all, but rather a Mark 46 stock, so that brings us to the question of what exactly is this gun a replica of? As far as we can tell, nothing. The older handguard and bipod coexisted with the newer fixed gas regulator and rail top cover from the mid-2000s to the early 2010s, but the para barrel would almost always be paired with a collapsible para stock, not a fixed one and certainly not a Mark 46 stock, and virtually all SOF guns of this era had the tri-rail handguard. On top of all that, all US M249s of this era were issued with a heat shield to cover the exposed portion of the barrel, which this replica obviously lacks. So this is a mutt, a seemingly random assortment of parts from the M249 family that doesn't match any real world configuration, and we suspect the plastic handguard and stock were likely chosen just to keep costs down for the base model. We'll be dressing it up later, but for now, I'll just say that otherwise, external impressions are pretty good. The metal looks as it should, and it intelligently uses steel for critical parts that are subject to the most stress. The plastic furniture doesn't creak or flex, and overall the gun feels solid. Before we get into internals though, we have to talk about the magazines, all three of them. First, the magazine that comes with the gun is just a VFC gas stanag with the top section replaced with a plug containing a release valve. Nothing much to talk about here. The gas inlet is at the back and it has a generic gray finish. It doesn't hold any BBs because this is purely a gas source. The other option for the power source is the box magazine. 
This is a massive aluminum gas reservoir inside a replica of the plastic 200 round belt box with a hose and adapter piece and a fill valve on the underside that can be accessed without removing the reservoir from the box. There's not much the plastic box needs to do, but one of the three in our local group has already broken its latch, and we have seen others online report the same, likely due to this plastic just being more brittle than its real counterpart. The actual internals will fit fine in a real M249 box, so that's a viable alternative. The box also comes with a 13 round belt of plastic dummy ammo, and while we've seen worse, there's no mistaking it for real rounds. The actual BB feeding magazine is a cassette, similar in appearance to a P90 magazine, but much smaller. This is transparent plastic, so you can see at a glance how many rounds are left, but otherwise the externals of the cassette aren't particularly important, as it isn't replicating anything real and is hidden when in use, so let's move on to field stripping. First, I make sure the gun is unloaded, then disengage the safety and pull the trigger to drop the bolt. I can now pull out the top screw for the stock, which stays captive, but allows the stock to pivot downwards. This reveals the recoil spring and buffer assembly, which lifts out of a small track and comes out the back, and then I can pull the bolt carrier assembly out as well. On the front of the gun, pulling the barrel release and wiggling the barrel change handle forwards releases it, and it comes right out the front. Pretty much all the maintenance areas of the gun can be accessed with just that, but now let's fully disassemble. The lower rear takedown pin pushes right to left, like all the other pins, and also is held captive, and with that out I can both remove the stock, and now pivot down and remove the trigger group. Now you may notice that the trigger group has two small threaded holes on top, and these do correspond to holes in the receiver, implying that the gun should have two tiny screws securing the trigger group to the receiver. However, none of the guns we received actually have said screws, so we assume this must have been omitted from the final design. The handguard pin also pushes out right to left and is also retained by the handguard, and then it slides out the bottom. And then the gas tube turns 90 degrees to unlock, then pulls straight out, freeing the bipod. That's all the major assemblies, so let's look at the barrel. On the barrel, taking out two screws on the underside frees the outer barrel from the inner and its mounting block. Getting the hop unit out of this block now requires a gentle touch. Take out three screws, and then pry apart the two halves of the hop unit. And here we are. Standard GBB spec bucking, standard GBB spec coated aluminum barrel, a solid hop tensioner arm which is not my favorite, but I do like how the adjustment screw is kept in place with an o-ring. Note that because this screw is threaded directly into the hop arm rather than pressing against it, the hop adjustment is reversed from how this usually works. Clockwise reduces hop and counterclockwise increases it. As is typical for VFC's recent releases, there is no nub and a small contact patch, and this does limit what aftermarket buckings will work well with it, so for now we're sticking with stock, though to work optimally it requires a modification we'll show later. Well onto the receiver, and we very strongly recommend performing the disassembly we're about to show, because it is necessary to secure the box mag hanger as mentioned earlier. First, to go through the ejection port on the right side, and remove two hex screws holding on the magwell. Next, I remove the screw securing the feed tray. As mentioned before, this does not actually seem to be necessary to begin with, so we're not sure why it's there. Then the magwell comes right off. With the feed tray pivoted up, we can see a large assembly that I'm going to call the chamber, for reasons which will be apparent soon, but next I need to remove the wiggler. Straightforward enough. And now I have to remove the left side receiver rail, which just involves taking out all these big hex screws made to look like rivets. With all those out, I can work the rail out around the takedown pin and remove it. And now, finally, the chamber is free, and beneath it we can see the two offending screws. Almost all the screws in this gun were heavily threadlocked out of the box, but not these. So I've already gone ahead and threadlocked them, and I want to point out that there are two additional holes, but no corresponding threads in the bracket. 
Did VFC originally intend for four screws? Who knows, but regardless, it's vital that it stays in position. Okay, with that sorted, let's go back to the chamber, because this is really where all the magic happens. On the left side of the chamber is a tiny pressure vessel, which the gas inlet is threaded into. This has an overpressure relief valve on the front, which will trip at about 200 psi, and a release valve on the back. The complex assembly in front of the release valve is the valve knocker, so basically the entire valve system that would normally be partially in the magazine is instead in the gun. When the carrier comes forwards, it hits the valve knocker, releasing gas through a router built into the side of the chamber. It also allows a valve knocker lock to drop into position, keeping the valve open until the carrier just starts to retract, at which point a protrusion on the mock gas piston releases the valve knocker lock. It's a bit unconventional in arrangement, but fairly typical in functionality. But, so far I've had the gun set to dry fire mode. If I click the switch forwards to turn off dry fire, notice how the valve knocker pivots to the side to where it will no longer be contacted by the carrier. In order to align the valve knocker, a lever up top needs to be pressed to the side. This in turn is done by a lever on the side of the magazine, which is forced outwards by the presence of a BB in the feed lips. So, it'll shoot as long as there's a BB ready to go, and if there's no BB in the feed lips, it doesn't shoot. And there's just one more element, which is a small metal tab hidden inside the chamber. This gets pushed out of the way by the nozzle, and serves as a lock for the stop on empty lever, so that the stop on empty doesn't activate until the carrier cycles and the nozzle retracts. It's a lot of fiddly parts, and reassembly is a bit tricky, but overall this system is simpler than I expected, and seems reasonably well designed, aside from one fundamental issue that we'll talk about later. Though I have to say, I am a little nervous about maintenance, because if the valve assembly starts to leak, it will require all the steps so far, and then some to access it. And if it does leak, that means slowly bleeding out all the gas in the magazine any time it's attached to the gun. But the three 249s we've been working with remain fine, and we've yet to have any modern VFC magazines develop valve leaks, so only time will tell if this becomes a concern. Alright, now let's look at the bulk carrier group. This is surprisingly few parts, and is almost entirely made from aluminum, coming in at a mere 183 grams. That's comparable to aftermarket lightweight bulk carriers for the TMMWS, and is certainly a deliberate choice to maximize gas efficiency. Also, while it is three parts, it was assembled with a ridiculous amount of thread lock, and we were only able to remove the middle and forward sections together, incurring some pretty nasty gouges in the process because I didn't realize it was reverse threading before applying a few ugga duggas. Note that the piston is hollow, so it is possible to add weight if desired, but any weights will need a hollow core to permit the guide rod to pass through. While the faux bolt has a lot of details, clearly intended to make it look like the real thing, it's been left in the white rather than finished like the rest of the gun. On top of that, there are clear milling marks on one surface. This all strongly suggests rushed production, omitting surface finish and making last minute tolerancing corrections via mill. One interesting geometric detail is that the carrier has two catch surfaces. On a real 249, this helps prevent the gun from going runaway, but on the VFC version it means that even if the pressure gets so low that the gun can't fully cycle, it will still catch on the rear notch and be able to fire again. This allows it to keep cycling, even under severe cooldown. For the nozzle itself, it obviously has a somewhat atypical shape, but notice how the aperture which mates with the router is flush with the surface. This should help to reduce wear and tear on the router. While this long gouge in the side of the feed arm looks concerning, it appears to only be surface wear, the result of that locking piece for the stop on empty mechanism dragging across it in the chamber. We'll continue to monitor and make a follow up if we do run into issues. Well for now, let's get the nozzle out. This screw can be ignored as it is actually just there to present a steel surface for the wiggler to act against. Instead, I remove the two screws that secure the nozzle guide. Now I need to remove the nozzle spring plug, and this is very, very easy to screw up. First, I'm going to keep the nozzle pressed all the way back as I do this. Second, as soon as the screw starts to turn, I'm going to stop applying any forward pressure. I want the screw to back out from the plug, not for the plug to get pushed forwards. Once the screw is out, then I can pull the nozzle out the front. So just to explain that, the plug is retained by having an ovoid shape that matches up with the slot in the back of the carrier. Pushing forwards on the screw will cause it to slip out of that slot, and then turning the screw will just twist the return spring, destroying it in short order. I already screwed it up a little the first time, so a brand new one may look a bit different from this, but it's all functionally intact. Anyways, note that while the nozzle has two grooves for o-rings, it only came with an o-ring on the rear one. 
It appears to be slightly undersized, measuring at 14.5mm inner diameter, 18.5mm outer diameter, and while installing a slightly larger o-ring did improve the seal, it created odd FPS consistency problems in full auto that we believe are related to nozzle retraction. We also experimented with adding a second o-ring but saw the same inconsistency, so for now we suggest leaving it alone and replacing with the same size if cyclic rate or efficiency drop noticeably. As well, I want to point out the peculiar appearance of the rocket valve as if it is sealing off the nozzle. On most guns, the rocket valve is oriented with the open side facing towards the aperture so the gas just flows directly in. Here, the reversed orientation of the rocket valve appears to be a deliberate delaying mechanism, producing more stable FPS and preventing some cycling issues that we ran into when the valve was oriented seemingly the correct way. Well, now I use a punch to push the retaining pin out and then use a long tool to push all the remaining contents of the nozzle out the back. Pretty simple, just a long spacer, the rocket valve, and the rocket valve spring. This gun shoots about 1.7 joules at room temperature out of the box. Normally we would reduce power by shimming the interior of the rocket valve, but here that caused occasional low power in full auto, so shimming the back of the rocket valve works better. A CL Project adjustable valve is a drop-in fit and will allow on-the-fly adjustment, but we could not adjust it to any consistent value. Others online have reported success with these, and we suspect that these may have been manufactured incorrectly and are not interfacing properly. Reverse the process to get the nozzle back together, and again, pay careful attention to the rocket valve orientation. As well, it's possible to over-insert this spacer, so go slowly and stop as soon as you can see through the pinhole. To reinstall the nozzle into the carrier, it's important to get the plug aligned, making sure to include the o-ring so it can seal, and then once again hold the nozzle back and turn the screw gently until it's threaded in most of the way, and only push to tighten at the very end. Done. The recoil assembly is directly patterned off the real thing, using a plastic block to retain the recoil spring and guide rod. However, as on the real thing, there is a spring-loaded buffer assembly in the stock which presses this forwards. As the carrier comes back, it compresses the recoil spring, and at the end of travel, this all slams into the buffer in the stock, dampening the shock but also redirecting the energy forwards and increasing the cyclic rate. Interestingly, the VFC buffer spring is actually a lot stronger than a real one, and swapping in a real stock or just replacing the VFC buffer spring with a weaker substitute reduces the rate of fire. Here we've actually added a spacer behind the spring on a real buffer to make it behave more similarly to the VFC. If you want to disassemble the VFC buffer, just take out two screws, flip over the mount, and unscrew the buffer with a pair of needle nose pliers. It's thread locked, so this will take a bit of force. And lastly, the fire control group. It's just one sear into safety, about as simple as it gets. Pulling the trigger lowers the sear, allowing the bolt to drop. No fire selection, no semi-auto, no disconnector, no auto sear. Just pull the trigger for a rock and roll and release the stop. There's really no need to disassemble further, just be aware that the top pin is normally retained by the receiver and could fall out when out of the gun. We do note some minor distortion of the catch surface from use, but if this does start to round off and have difficulty engaging the carrier, it will be trivial to reshape into an ideal right angle. Overall, these internals have been clearly optimized for efficiency above all else, using a light carrier group, soft recoil spring, and strong buffer system to maximize rate of fire while minimizing gas consumption. Integrating the release valve into the gun is certainly novel for an otherwise fairly conventional gas blowback system, and the way the gun handles stop on empty is clever and seems robust. Wear and tear in general seems minimal after about 10,000 rounds, and the system has basically no high-stress interactions between parts, so we expect that this gun will hold up well enough to high round counts to be usable as an airsoft machine gun. We have found that the nozzle is extremely sensitive to alteration, and deviating from the default setup can quickly cause problems, but the power adjustment method we showed seems safe, and there's no need to mess with it further. One last thing I want to mention is that the gun came with a lot of grease on the internals, and while we've cleaned off the parts for the sake of review, this gun actually needs heavy lubrication to minimize wear and tear. 
Aluminum is prone to galling, and this will cause significant wear or contact points unless there is a surface barrier. The nozzle should be kept clean, but otherwise all contact points between the carrier and other metal parts should be heavily greased. Anyways, there are a few internal details to note on the various magazines. Unlike VFC's conventional V3 magazines, this Stanag uses an O-ring to seal the top rather than a fitted gasket. It also has a simple push valve, which we've noticed can get stuck open if actuated when empty, and then needs to be reset with a screwdriver. Otherwise, the capacity is about the same as a normal VFC Stanag, holding up to about 30 grams of propane after chilling, and weighs about 320 grams empty. Meanwhile, the box mag disassembles by removing one of the side caps with a ton of screws, and... I'm not sure what I expected. It's a box, with a fitted gasket at either side, two separated chambers with tiny apertures at either end to connect them, a hole for a fill valve, and a hole for the output line. After chilling, we were able to get about 150 grams of propane into this box, although this does take a very, very long time. Three hours later. The line on top appears to be silicone tubing with an outer diameter of about 8 millimeters, protected by a spring to prevent it from kinking. Something I find interesting is that the hole in the box that it threads into is standard 1 8 inch NPT, so this fitting could be replaced with any off-the-shelf plumbing if desired. The entire box assembly with plastic belt is 1,040 grams, or 2.3 pounds empty, so once gassed up, one box weighs as much as 3.5 gas magazines while holding 5 times as much gas. The cassette magazine incorporates the feed lips, as is typical for gas mags, but as mentioned before, the stop on empty system is a little different. It's not spring loaded, instead, just pivoting freely, getting pushed out by the BBs sitting in the feed lips. The magazine also has a spring loaded tab, which is what actually locks it into the gun, and lastly, there's a single cap that encloses the feed spring, making it much easier to disassemble and reassemble if needed. The cassette is 60 grams, which is so little that fully loading the magazine will about double its weight, depending on the BBs used. The cassette magazines load with either the aluminum pen-style speed loader VFC includes with the gun, or any standard speed loader capable of exerting enough force. These mags become difficult to load after the first 50 BBs or so, and reaching the full 175 is proven impossible with some mags even using the VFC speed loader. We also ran into functional problems when loading to capacity, which we'll cover later. The manual of arms for the M249 may take some getting used to. To start with, there are two rules. Number one, don't try to move the bolt on safe. Number two, don't do anything with the bolt forwards. What I mean is that when the gun is set to safe, it obviously can't fire, but the carrier can't be removed or charged either. So it has to be set to fire to charge the action, and generally speaking, unless it's just sitting on the shelf, it should be kept charged for a number of reasons. The first is because if a gassed magazine or box is inserted while the bolt is forwards on a loaded mag, it will immediately fire, and if the gun is set to safe, the carrier will mash into the sear. So make sure the bolt carrier is locked to the rear before interacting with the gas inlet. Second, the barrel shouldn't be removed with the nozzle forwards as it risks torquing the nozzle. Third, the dry fire selector won't toggle properly if the nozzle is in the way. And fourth, if the bolt is forwards when the magazine is swapped, slamming down the top cover will be mashing the BB into the top of the nozzle and hoping the stack of BBs can compress. If the cassette is fully loaded, there's a chance the nozzle will break instead. Also on a real open bolt machine gun, it's proper practice to charge the action before opening to avoid the possibility that there's a chamber dud about to cook off from heat, so embrace the LARP and always rack the charging handle before doing anything else. And since we're already LARPing, on a real machine gun you do this palm up both for better control and so that if you do slip and it fires, your thumb doesn't get schwacked by hypothetical ejecting brass or worse, dislocated by a reciprocating charging handle. Here the charging handle is non-reciprocating and while the bolt can push it forwards on its own, it's best to lock it back forwards manually. Put the weapon on safe, and now the gas supply can be installed. It takes significant effort to lock the Stanag into the magazine well. We added a little witness mark so we know when it's inserted far enough, and out of the box it would not release easily. We've heard of multiple people breaking the magazine release, and we suspect that this is because there's no clear feedback that the magazine is actually unlocked. It's just apply pressure to the catch, then pull, wiggling the mag out if needed. Once this breaks in with use, the gas pressure inside the mag will help eject it, and then mag changes with the included Stanag become... fairly... easy. But they still require excessive force to insert against gas pressure. 
Box mag changes, though, are simply a pain, because the hose has to make this big 180 degree turn, but also has that spring to stiffen it so it doesn't kink, and seems to be too long for this geometry to work. We shortened the hose on this one by about an inch, and that seems to help a lot, but it's still unreasonably tough to wrangle both the box and the gas connector into place simultaneously, and once again it takes a lot of effort to lock in. Well, in contrast to the gas mags, the cassettes are actually easier than they look. First, open the top cover, either hook the top in and then push in the bottom, or insert the body of the mag into the top cover while sliding it downwards, then push the top in to pop it into place. Remove the mag by pushing down on the top catch and pulling outwards. Adjusting the hop is done with a 1.5mm hex key through the top, and once again I want to point out that this can be done without removing the barrel, and that tightening decreases hop while loosening increases it. Keeping a dedicated hop adjustment key in the pistol grip storage compartment isn't a bad idea. The bipod is deployed by squeezing its legs together and swinging downwards, and they spring out into the lock position. Securing the bipod just requires reversing this action and pushing it into lock. The only other controls are the safety and trigger. The safety clicks left to fire and right for safe, and is neither too stiff nor too soft. The trigger is just a long, continuous pull that drops the bolt at the very end. On my list of priorities for a machine gun, the trigger feel sits somewhere between what shape of screws does it use and does it have a cup holder, so let's get to shooting, starting with the included Stanag and cassette mags loaded to 100 rounds. Well, I can already tell this is more efficient than conventional gas rifles because I'm shooting bursts at 18 to 20 RPS and not immediately running into cooldown. Still, it runs out of gas just before clearing 100 rounds. It's clear that this gun is meant to be used with the box mag despite it being sold as a separate accessory. With a fully gassed box, cooldown is much less noticeable, and even in these sustained bursts with cassette changes every 100 rounds, the gun is able to manage just under 450 shots before it fails to cycle. As far as recoil, part of that high efficiency obviously comes from the lack of reciprocating weight compared to conventional rifles. Single shots have little recoil, but the high cyclic rate means it's repeating that recoil 20 times per second, accompanied by a fairly loud and distinctive report, and that really amplifies the experience. I don't think the recoil is going to wow anyone with a Daytona or an HPA tapped gas rifle, but it's still a gas blowback machine gun. Because it fires from an open bolt, there's a lock time of about an eighth of a second before it actually fires, but the practical impact is minimal. This is a gun that's fired exclusively in bursts, so it isn't really noticeable in use. It does make for a slightly different and more realistic feel to shooting it, because I can feel the bolt slamming forwards at the start of the firing cycle rather than it immediately blowing back from the first bolt. On the Chrono, the gun is fairly consistent within a roughly 10 FPS range. At nearly 20 rounds per second, the practical impact of this deviation is minimal. Now we get to accuracy, and this is not ideal. Even with the hop dialed in, we see significant vertical stringing and occasional deviations to either side, both on our guns and in other reviews online. And I know what you're thinking, just swap out the bucking, but that isn't the issue. Much like the Northeast Uzi we previously reviewed, this is a fundamental problem with how the system implements open bolt operation. Basically, as the carrier moves forwards, it strips a BB from the magazine and starts to feed it into the hop-up, but the carrier trips the gas release while it's still moving forwards. That means the BB never comes to a rest before being fired, and any unwanted rotation on it, say from rolling up the feed ramp or even just rotating as it gets forced into the bucking, will still be present as it fires and will cause the BB to hook in the direction of that rotation. There is a fix, but before getting into modifying the gun, let's talk practicality in stock form. Out of the box, the gun comes in at just under 3 feet long, comparable in overall length to a 14.5 inch AR. What's really surprising about it, and what we've been deliberately hiding so far in this review, is just how light it is. Without a gas mag or cassette, this clocks in at a mere 8 pounds, and even with a gas box and loaded cassette, it's just 11 pounds. That's heavy for a rifle, but it's literally half the weight of a real M249. And unlike the featherweight AEG M249s, we should reiterate that there is no plastic in the body of this gun, it's just lots of aluminum. 
Plus, the M249 itself is fairly ergonomic as far as machine guns go. It has a chunky handguard, a steeply angled pistol grip conducive to modern stances, a box mag that stays mostly out of the way in use, a carry handle that stays put and can't flop into the sight line, and a bipod that stows neatly but is easy to deploy if needed. The sling mounts are well placed and have stood up to use, but with the low weight a sling really isn't needed for carry. The irons are high enough for a sight picture even with a face mask, and have a fairly wide rear aperture and easy zeroing procedure, and the rail is long enough to permit a variety of optics. Overall, I wouldn't say this handles like a rifle, but it certainly handles more like a rifle than it does like a PKM M60 M240 or other full-size steel body GPMG. That helps a lot when it's time to reload, and these cassette mags are apparently a big point of contention. I actually quite like the concept. They fit neatly in pistol or SMG mag pouches, and an M249 gunner's pouch can comfortably carry about 12. Because these are essentially AEG mid caps, they can be dropped without worrying about getting dirt or mud in valves, and are cheap, so stocking up on mags isn't anywhere near as expensive as with traditional gas blowback magazines. Having gotten accustomed to gas guns, I don't find myself short on ammo, and even suppression is viable with short bursts. Reloading isn't too hard once you get the hang of it, plus I like that it involves interacting with the top cover on a belt fed, and being able to open up the feed tray and see at a glance how much ammo you have remaining is really nice. So yeah, hot take, the cassettes are a good concept for airsoft machine guns. But the execution of that concept is half-baked. Some magazines don't feed perfectly if loaded to the full 175, so every once in a while they'll hesitate just long enough for the stop on empty to engage, and the gun goes click. As well, these magazines really are unreasonably difficult to load, and they require so much force to load to 175 that it can chip or break even high-quality non-bio BBs, and then cause hard jams. Oh god. Oh god. Even worse, the excessive force applied to the BBs can dent them and compromise accuracy, and it also causes a scraped-off BB residue to build up on the feed track, which exacerbates all these problems until the mag barely Problem. feeds at all. All these problems can be avoided by following VFC's recommendation to only load them to 100, and then, yeah, they work fine. But it's inexcusable that VFC would release magazines that simply do not work as designed, and just to rub salt in the wound, they usually don't feed the last BB. Now as for the gas supply, the Stanag makes a great door stop or a decent hammer, but it's pretty worthless as a power source for this gun. If you're going to use the gun on propane, you need the box mag, and even that isn't all sunshine and rainbows. It's expensive for starters, and it's a hassle to change out the box in gameplay, which is an extra burden on top of changing cassettes. And while the fill valve is positioned so that it can be refilled while attached to the gun, it needs something like a foam spacer internally to keep it aligned. With the fill valve on the underside, too, it's game over if the box touches mud, and while the port could just be covered with tape and peeled off to fill, that's yet another thing to deal with in-game. And lastly, once the box does get cold, it needs time to warm back up, so repeatedly refilling and shooting through the same box will cause extreme cooldown, and it takes a very, very long time to fill. Practically, we feel that two boxes is the minimum requirement, so at least one can be recovering from cooldown at any time. Also worth noting that when the box mag is in use, the magazine well cover is still flipped open, making the release tab stick up. With a bullet belt installed, the rounds draped across the top of the tab are getting pulled back and forth by the wiggler, and this can actually trip the release and out pops the gas block. It's more likely to happen with a belt of real rounds due to their weight, but can still happen with the plastic dummies. If necessary, disabling this feature is as easy as tightening the screw it rides on. Now, as far as aftermarket, VFC has made the respectable decision to introduce the M249 as an ecosystem of parts. In addition to the box mag, VFC already offers a para stock, a railed handguard, a foregrip for it, an extension to replicate the 18.3 inch full length barrel, and a more modern collapsible stock. More stuff is promised, primarily the 100 round cloth box and some early style furniture, but surprisingly not the heat shield that has been a staple of the M249 since the product improvement program in 1989. Real heat shields fit, but run upwards of 100 bucks for a piece of perforated sheet steel riveted to a plastic block, or the all-plastic A&K heat shield is a drop-in for 20 bucks. Other pieces of real furniture fit, including stock and handguard, with no modification, so we're able to assemble a mid-2000s M249. With the non-adjustable gas system and rail top cover, we can't replicate an older gun than that, but DNA has promised some retro parts, so aftermarket may provide. And lastly, we'd really like to see an aftermarket or even just 3D printed alternative cassette magazine that actually works as designed. A single stack mag that maxes out at 100 ought to be much easier to load, particularly if an Odin speedloader can be used. 
Overall, I hope we've successfully conveyed that this is a gun that's got some cool ideas and lots of build options, but has more rough edges than a cheese grater. I strongly feel that the concept here is more practical than many of the knee-jerk comments assumed it would be, particularly for players already accustomed to gas blowback, but it's undeniable that the execution is lacking. So, let's fix it. First things first, that open bolt problem is unacceptable. It's a machine gun! Yeah, it's a machine gun, but if I wanted to indiscriminately spray BBs in the general direction of the enemy, I'd rather use the flamethrower. The good news is that rectifying this problem is a fairly simple modification. As with the Northeast Uzi we previously reviewed, adding a compression spring to the nozzle to stand it off from the carrier solves it, allowing the nozzle to feed the BB just a tiny bit sooner, and then compress into the carrier for the last quarter inch of travel. We found an off-the-shelf spring that does the job, and designed a 3D printable simple block to hold it. Let's demonstrate just how much difference this makes. First, firing with the stock carrier again. And now with the spring mod. This is a significant difference in consistency, and we feel that the stock hop is sufficient provided this simple modification is made. We'll put the block on Thingiverse, and hopefully also Shapeways, and link it in the description. The spring itself came from a variety pack, and is about 18mm or 3 quarters of an inch long, with a spring rate of about 1.7 pounds per inch, and an outer diameter of 6mm or just under a quarter inch. We'll link the pack it came in, and also a comparable equivalent from McMaster Car, but there's a lot of leeway here, so anything of roughly the same rate and length will work. Just use a bit of super glue or epoxy to secure the spring into the housing, and then epoxy the housing to the nozzle's guide track so it sits flush with the front. Now the next issue to address is the power source. You already know where this is going, and we really do feel that HPA is the best way to run these guns, but not by tapping the gas box. In fact, I can simply reach through the magwell to unscrew the gas inlet with a pair of needle nose pliers, revealing standard 1 8 inch MPT threading. The gun can now be converted to HPA by just screwing in a push connect fitting and then attaching a section of macro line. We've also gone a step further and drilled a hole through the cover to run the macro line through, so now the magwell cover is closed as it should be when feeding from a belt. None of us at XE are fans of HPA for gas blowback rifles, but for a machine gun it allows sustained full auto fire without worrying about regassing on the field, temperature changes affecting power, cooldown, buying tons and tons of propane, or the connector popping out. I really can't overstress how much this transforms the experience, making the power source completely set and forget and allowing the shooter to focus on just putting fire down range and swapping cassettes. Note that because the gun has no internal reservoir, the narrower diameter of macro line restricts input compared to the larger tubing of the gas box, so the regulator has to be set slightly higher to get comparable performance. 120 to 130 psi straight into the gun will behave like the box mag does at room temperature, but it can go significantly lower, and for the moment we're using around 100 to 110 psi, producing 1.4 to 1.5 joules with a 0.5 mm shim on the rocket valve. With how efficient the gun is, it does not require an enormous air tank. Also, having the gun directly tapped and the mag in the top cover means airsoft is finally liberated from the tyranny of box mags on LMGs, and the gun can be fielded with the belt hanging off the side as Rambo intended on the one machine gun that in the real world is almost always fielded with a box. Oh well. But what if we didn't want to use the cassettes? What if we did want a box magazine that holds tons and tons of ammo? Well, check this out. Just snip a few interior walls from a donor mag, snip a hole in the side, very carefully drill up to the feed lips with an 8mm drill bit, and feed a spring tube through, and now this cassette is serving as an adapter for a standard AEG box mag. This may also need a longer spring tube, which we'll link a listing for in the description, but otherwise an AEG box mag is now a drop-in fit. And to add more recoil, steel M6 washers with an outer diameter of 12mm will fit in the piston without binding on the recoil spring. A full stack adds about 73 grams for a more respectable total of 256 grams of reciprocating mass. Now the VFC can shake my fillings out nearly as well as the Vipertech, and from testing this does not appear to cause undue wear and tear. Well, to the gun at least. In some ways, this is now just a Daytona gun with extra steps, but I think this represents an iteration on that otherwise stagnant escort system. This gun fires from an open bolt with a functional manual of arms, much more realistic internals, and a modern hop-up design. More importantly, it offers the choice between unlimited ammo or more realistic reloading, plus more granular control over recoil, power, and cyclic rate for different use cases or environments, and all these parameters can be adjusted at will without major parts replacement or disassembly. 
We'll see if it has anything like the legendary Daytona reliability, but from how little wear we've seen so far, we're optimistic. So just to summarize, our total set of recommended modifications is as follows. Remove, threadlock, and reinstall the box mag hanger screws. Adjust the rocket valve if needed. Install a compression spring in the nozzle to stand it off from the carrier. And then if you're willing to tolerate the hose, and we really strongly recommend it, tap for HBA. That's all it takes to get this gun to what we would consider good performance. Further modifications to consider are swap the stock buffer spring for a weaker one, or install a real stock to reduce cyclic rate, add weight to the piston to increase recoil, or convert to AEG box mag feed for unlimited ammo. Well, time for pros and cons to wrap things up. The VFC M249 is a particularly novel replica, the first airsoft machine gun based on modern gas blowback design. On top of that, the gun itself is an intelligently designed mix of aluminum and steel that minimizes weight without compromising structural integrity in any core area. However, it's also apparent that this was a rushed production, with some screws inexplicably coming without any thread lock, provisions for parts that aren't included, and a conspicuous lack of finishing on the bow carrier group. The shooting experience does everything it promises, it's blowback, it's full auto, it's efficient, it has decent recoil and noise, though the gas box is a hassle to deal with, the cassette mags only half work, and that open bolt accuracy issue is annoying, albeit easily fixed. But most significantly, the fact that the gun integrates so seamlessly with HPA and alternate ammo sources provides additional options for practicality. And that brings us to price. The gun itself is about 700 USD shipped, and then three extra packs of mags for a comfortable total of 10 runs another 100 bucks. So that's about 800, and then if you want to use gas, we suggest a minimum of two boxes for another 250 or so, already breaking the $1,000 mark before even getting into cosmetics. If you're accustomed to gas blowback rifles, we think you'll enjoy being able to outspam semi-only riflemen for a change, but if you're still looking at over a grand for a gun that has some usability issues and won't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with AEG machine guns, that's hard to recommend. Now, if you're willing to use an HPA setup, then that changes things. Skip the VFC gas boxes, take 5 minutes to swap to HPA, and now it achieves the raw effectiveness of an AEG machine gun while having all the fun of a gas blowback rifle. Even the caveat of needing to reload every 100 rounds goes away with the I can't believe it's not Daytona gun setup. All this capability comes in at around the cost of an AEG M249 plus HPA engine, and requires only a modest amount of tinkering to achieve. Overall, the M249 is a solid design let down by rough execution and the inherent limitations of its power source, and it really could have used another six months of R&D. However, just tapping for HPA makes a huge difference for practicality, and the remaining issues are mostly solvable by the end user, annoying though that is. The biggest candidate for improvement is the cassette magazine design, which is usable but falls well short of its potential, so if you're on the fence about this gun, it might be worth waiting to see if either VFC or Aftermarket addresses that. But even in its current state, with a minimum of work, this becomes a skirmishable gun at a reasonable price point that fulfills the underappreciated but extremely entertaining niche of gas blowback machine gunning. We hope this video helps with your purchasing decision, or that you at least just found it informative. And as always, thanks for watching. Got him! Fire when ready. Guys, oh. thank you so much for helping me.